Well, hello everyone, uh, I'm John Hornick, and uh, I'm a partner at a law firm in Washington called Finnegan. Uh, we're one of the largest IP firms in the world. Um, we have about 350 attorneys, and I lead our 3D printing working group, which is about 30 attorneys. And I speak about 3D printing quite often. In fact, today is the 75th presentation that I've made to an audience on 3D printing in the last little over two years. But I'm going to talk, tell you right now that I'm unapologetic about calling it 3D printing. I think that term helps to drive the adoption of the technology. It's sexier. If I ask you what would you rather see, my brand new 3D printer or my brand new additive manufacturing machine, which one you'd rather see? But today I'm not going to talk about the law at all. Um, this is a thought experiment. This is a thought experiment about the potential effects of 3D printing on traditional business models and supply chains. And I had particular companies in mind when I created this presentation, but I'm going to use a fictional company as an illustration rather than naming names. The warp drive was invented by Dr. Zephram Cochran in the year 2063. He was born in Bozeman, Montana in 2030, and he was the first to create a warp drive capable starship that he called the Phoenix. He created it from a, uh, a Titan II missile. By the year start date 2073, he had his own company that he called Zephram Warp Drives, or Zephram WD, which was known by this logo. And their biggest product, their best selling product, was the gravimetric field displacement manifold commonly known as the warp core. And by the way, all of this is available on Google. If you, if you Google Zeph from Cochrane or Warp Drive, you'll find all of this stuff. Now, by uh, start date 2115, uh, Zeph from WD didn't really have much competition for uh, their warp drives uh, because they had created incredible economies of scale and great efficiencies, so the product was extremely profitable. Their biggest and best customer was the United Federation of Planets. And Zeph from WD had traditional manufacturing facilities that they kept operating 24-7, 365, making parts the traditional way for their customers, including their biggest customer, United Federation of Planets. But then, around start date 2115, somewhere on Earth, a company called Scan Depot reverse engineered and 3D scanned Zeph from WD's warp drives inside and out, and they created digital blueprints for all of the parts. They started to sell these parts on the Galactic Wide Web at their website, gww.scandepot.com, and they made these digital blueprints for Jeff from WD's parts available for one-tenth one of the price of a Zeph from WD part. And you could print that part yourself if you bought the blueprint, or Scan Depot would print it for you. If they printed it for you, they'd charge one third the price of a new Zephyr WD part. For a little bit more money, Scan Depot would customize those blueprints, or they would print a customized part. Now, the next meeting of the board of Zephyr WD was not a pretty sight. Fear ran deep. They started doing some research, and they found this star date 2013 3D printing study that was done by IBM, where IBM said, quote, the competitive advantage from both proprietary design and parts production is expected to erode as basic design blueprints become widely available via open source. And the service parts business will lead to digital transformation, leaving companies unable to generate profits from selling spares. Unquote. They also found this Stardate 2014 article by Robert Budge, who said, with AM, meaning out of the manufacturing, government departments will now want to make all of their own spares, unquote, and they will, quote, eliminate the contractor from the equation, unquote. They also found this Space Daily article from Stardate 2015, which said, quote, this could lead militaries to cut out private defense contractors altogether. Now, Jeff from WD, they said, well, this can't happen to us. We're immune to third parties scanning and printing our workforce because they are so mission critical. And Zeph from Cochrane, who was still young from warping around the galaxy faster than the speed of light, he said, 
Quote, we need to show our customers that we are on top of this problem, protect them from counterfeit workforce, and send a message to the industry that anyone who wants to sell digital blueprints for Zephyrin WD warp draw cores will face us in court. So, they lawyered up. They beefed up their IP portfolio. They hired an army of K Street lobbyists. They drew up a litigation hit list. And they started calling in political favors and greasing palms. But then they started to see the handwriting on the wall. And they realized that customers, like the United Federation, they would start with 3D printing obsolete parts, parts that they couldn't get in any other way. And by 3D printing obsolete parts, they'd start to get experience with the technology. They'd see what it could do. They would realize that they could save a lot of money by doing this and that they could essentially eliminate inventories of parts. They'd no longer have to inventory any parts. They could just make them when they needed them. And they realized that the next step would be to make any part, anywhere, anytime. And that their biggest customer could become their biggest competitor. Then there was a major announcement from the United Federation of Planets. They said every starship is going to be outfitted with a high-end 3D scanner, a high-end 3D printer, so that the ship's engineers can make and customize parts wherever in the galaxy they happen to be. And then they even started to sound like a competitor when the United Federation adopted this slogan, any part, anywhere, anytime. The Federation realized that they could disrupt supply chains by using 3D printing. They could remake the supply chains. They could eliminate inventories. They could eliminate warehouses. They would no longer have to ship parts across the galaxy. And they'd save a lot of money. And Zephyrm WD, they realized that if they were to sue their biggest customer, that would be like cutting off their nose to spite their face. They realized that they had to start thinking outside the box. So they went back to that 2000, start date 2013 IBM 3D printing study that said, for leading global companies to prosper in this new environment, radical change is essential, unquote. They also found this start date 2014 Wallers report, which said, in the world of AM, again, out of the manufacturing, the central embodiment of an artifact, the thing that we buy and sell and improve, will be the information used to manufacture the object, not the object itself. <clears throat> they also found this Stardate October 2015 report from the U.S. Postal Service that said, quote, warehouses will shift from physical to digital as the designs of spare parts are stored in vast libraries for future on-demand printing, unquote. Then, Zephyrin Cochran, he had a great idea of the type that led him to invent the warp drive in the first place. He thought to himself, why would a company want to make a product when it can sell the design instead? But by roughly start day 2119, they really didn't have any choice. The market for mass-produced parts was drying up. And they realized that they were going to have to start to sell digital blueprints instead, and also customized products, customized parts. They realized that their business model was being shaken to the core. So they began the painful, painful transition of their business model. Directors fought over it. People were fired. Other people resigned. Egos were damaged. But finally it dawned on them that they could go from this to this. They could go from being a behemoth mass producer to a leaner and meaner engineering and digital information company. So they realized that what they could start doing is selling digital blueprints, selling designs rather than selling parts. They start to sell digital blueprints and they maintain a small bespoke factory of 3D printers for making customized parts for their customers. They'd also have a galaxy-wide web of licensed fabricators who could make and repair parts. Their new product line would be encrypted blueprints and also the specifications for making 
the parts, whatever they happen to be. It also include specifications on what machines had to be used, what materials had to be used, what are the qualifications of the operators who operate the machines, what are the quality control and process requirements, and what's the secret sauce to make this part. Maybe it'd be locked up in a kernel by a company like Identify 3D. Their new product line could be printed, could be printed by any customer, could be printed by authorized fabricators, or it could be printed in Zephram WD's bespoke factory. And if all of these requirements were met, then Zephram WD would warranty, would warrant these parts. They'd stand behind them. And for all of this value added, they could charge a premium over what Scan Depot charged for its blueprints. They were surprised by the benefits of making this transition in their business. Their revenue per sale really went down, but their profits per part really went up because they eliminated a lot of overhead. They closed a lot of factories. They reduced a lot of labor, although a lot of those employees went off and they opened their own independent fabricators that were approved to make parts and repair parts for Zephyr WD. Their capital expenditures, they went through the floor. They sold off a lot of real estate and they saved a lot of energy. And Zephyr WD realized that they could break the supply chains and remake the supply chains. They no longer needed to have materials. They eliminated most of the material costs. They realized that they didn't have to inventory parts. They could get rid of their warehouses. And they realized that they didn't have to ship parts across the galaxy. And now they had very different jobs at Zephyr WD. Now they employed product designers who created new parts, new, new, uh, new, new parts, new warp drives, and who tweaked existing ones, and also who customized parts for their customers. They employed rapid prototyping specialists who could make these parts quickly, iterate them quickly, provide them to the customer quickly. They employed digital design, digital blueprint specialists, and also security specialists because these digital blueprints, they were their crown jewels. They needed to be protected against any theft or hacking, espionage, for example. They employed now quality control specialists and also licensing specialists. They licensed this technology across the galaxy. And they had a team of customer service people who would deal with the galaxy-wide network of authorized fabricators. And finally, they maintained a small core of bespoke factory workers. Now, the moral of this story, as my colleague Alice Chesofsky of IHS Technology says, he says, quote, 3D printing is like a train. You're either on the train or you're under it. However, that Stardate 2013 IBM study found that, quote, a substantial portion of manufacturers may be caught off guard by the rapid changes that are underway. Zephyr WD, they were lucky. They managed to make the painful leap from the paradigms of the Industrial Revolution to become a company that made full use of the benefits of 3D printing. They went from being a behemoth mass producer of Goliath size to becoming a smaller digital library and David-sized bespoke factory. Some companies have not made, been so lucky, have not made the transition into the digital age. But then they realized that they had a brand new set of problems. They started to notice that digital blueprints for their parts, and also the parts themselves, started to appear on websites on the Galaxy Wide Web, such as Star Bay and Astro Baba and Yoda's List. And this led Cochrane to answer, ask the question, what does genuine, what is a genuine part, what does that mean in a 3D printed world? That's a story for another day. Stay tuned. Thank you for your time. Look for my book, 3D Printing Will Rock the World. It will be out in about a week, available from Amazon. If you're interested in getting on my list, send me an email or give me your card, and I'll make sure you know when it's published. Thank you. has any questions about what might happen to Zephyr WD or any other company, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes? 
Ma'am. I really enjoyed the story. Uh, it was a good analogy for the background of the So, yes. Well, um, in other presentations that I give, I talk about what I call the ability to make three D print things away from control. The away from control means the ability to make something without anyone knowing about it, without anyone being able to control it. I believe that the digital blueprints. Um, I think I believe the companies will be forced to start selling digital blueprints rather than making products. Uh, but when they start to do that, those digital blueprints, they really are the crown jewels. If they become available uh, out there on the, <coughs> on the internet or through some other source, then the company can lose the ability to control the making of their products. Anyone can start to make uh, replacement parts uh, without anyone knowing about it or being able to control it. And 3D scanning is also a big risk there because you don't even need to have a blueprint. If you have a good enough 3D scanner, you scan the part that you need, you create, and we have clients who are worried about this and who are trying to develop strategies to work around this. Someone has a 3D uh, scanner, they scan the part, they make the digital blueprint, then they start making the part themselves. And this is happening now. Uh, you know, you hear a lot of speakers, they all often say a lot of the stuff we do is, is, is under, under NDAs. Well, part of the reason for that is because the original equipment manufacturers don't really want, I mean, I mean the, the companies who are printing parts don't really want the original equipment manufacturers to know what they're doing. In other words, they're making parts away from control. Sometimes they're making those from, from digital blueprints, sometimes they're making them from, uh, that, that they obtain from some source, and sometimes they're making them from scans that they create themselves. So, uh, as time goes on, I think that although companies will move more towards selling digital blueprints rather than parts, uh, they'll also face great challenges from companies like Scan Depot, uh, or from uh, just generic uh, generic designs that are available for parts through various sources like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, illegal websites on the internet, legal websites, or just making making scanning the part themselves and creating a blueprint. Long answer to your question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. When you uh, do you take into account the equivalent in software available source in terms of people who are potentially sharing the designs? Well, I think that's part of it. Uh, another thing that I talk about in another presentation I give is how there's really kind of an anti-IP movement. Some people want to make their designs open. And um, a, a great example of this is um, one that I give of a, of a little toy dump truck where right now you can, you could, it looks like a name brand dump truck and um, sooner or later the blueprints for the name brand dump truck might be available on the internet, but whoever sells those blueprints is going to want to charge something for them. The dump truck that I give as an example, it's available on the internet for free. It's open. It's open source. So, so, so why would anybody pay for the, uh, the name brand digital file when they can get a reasonable substitute for free? And then what they can do is they can tweak it and they make it look just like the name brand. They can even put the name brand on there. So it's illegal to do that, but no one's going to know about it. No one's going to be able to control it. They'll be away from control. So I think, yeah, open source is one way that designs can be disseminated broadly. But there are other ways as well. Some of them will be legal. Some of them will be illegal. Anybody else? Okay. Well, oh, yes, sir. Well, yes and, no. yes and no. I think that right now I think the technology is relatively primitive compared to where it will be in 10 years or in 50 years. I think it will be far less primitive in far less time than we, we think that it will. But it's already happening. Uh, another example that I give in other presentations is of a company that um, is in the power, power generation business. They use turbine blades. They have to replace these turbine blades every now and then at costs, very high cost. But what they're doing now is they're using 3D printing not to make new turbine blades, but to repair the old turbine blades. Specifically, they're using direct energy deposition to do that. And this is great for the company that needs the turbine blades. It's terrible for the company that sells the blades. And a lot of this is already happening. So um, 
on the scale that I'm talking about with Zephyrm WD, I, I think that that's a few years off. I don't, I don't think it's 50 years off. I think it's more like 10 years off. Um, if I turn out to be wrong and it's 20 years off, it's still pretty soon. But it's, it's happening now and it will just scale up over time. And I go into this in much greater detail in the book, which will be out just in time for Christmas shopping. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you think the material landscape will change over time? Material landscape. Yeah, well, materials are really the key to a lot of this, and I was discussing this with some people last night. Uh, the technology, the machines that print things, obviously very important, but to be able to have, um, to be able to have the type of disruption that this technology can cause, you really have to have hybrid materials uh, uh, or uh, nanomaterials, materials that are highly flexible, that, uh, and I don't mean in the ninja flex way, but flexible in the sense of uh, being able to um, uh, what, what, what Stratasys, I guess, called digital materials. So yeah, I think there's a, this is like a potentially golden age for material scientists. Anyone else? Oh, oh yes, sir. Yeah, is a definition on the upper end how complicated the product is? It, it was, so the question is, is, is how complicated the product is in upper limit? I, I think theoretically, yes. <clears throat> but um, when, you know, I hear people say, well, we'll never be able to print something like this, a smartphone, in the home. That's probably true. And, so, and other people say, well, you can never do it because you'd have to be able to print 25 or 40 or 50 materials. But I don't think that's what will happen. I think what will happen is that um, it won't look anything like this and it won't feel anything like this. It just needs to have the functionality of this and it will be done in maybe two or three or four materials. So yeah, if you want to do this, then there is a complexity upper limit and it will be take longer and longer and longer before we have the ability to do that kind of thing. But if you change the look and feel and you simplify the amount of materials that are put into it because you have highly flexible materials that, that can do it, then, then you're not building something of this complexity, you're building something of far less complexity. And I think you'll be able to do that sooner. Anyone else? All right, great. Thank you for your time. <laughs>